first cave exploration. Let's see what's in this thing. All right. Holy shit. Look at all the stuff in there. Look at how deep it goes. Wow. Crazy. <laughs> what? Man, look at all this stuff. That's a random item. No foot in it. Russian rubber boot? Yeah. Crazy. Crab trap floats. Lots of crab trap floats. Get out outside luck. <laughs> Crazy is that? Here comes the heat. Ooh, it's gonna be hot today. I got, I think I'm caught up. I'm almost ready to go, except I don't have my hunting gear ready to go, but I'll do that later. After this weekend, I gotta go back out to the ocean, get beat up. And uh, there's a good handful of people from here coming fishing shortly, should be interesting. Hopefully nobody's an actual paid assassin. <laughs> but anyway, what do we got? We got more. So many more. I'm just going to get into it. By the time you're hearing this, I'm on the water. All right, listen to this. I can start with some, some recent ones, all right, to ensure there's no duplicates being screamed out. You know how that can affect some people. This is titled, Oh Yeah. Hi Steve, thanks for letting the world know about everything you do. So I'm gonna sound crazy, but those who know me know that I don't really care what anyone thinks. My guy and I went camping on the long weekend, northwest of Sundry, Alberta. My usual spot was taken, so we kept looking for a spot on the trunk road. We happened upon a beautiful place of land, I had a weird feeling someone was watching us, even though no one was around. We had a great night and explored the area a little bit. We found a deer carcass, totally picked clean, except for the legs were still there. There was also a massive pile of dung, and I mean massive. We assumed it was horse dung, as there are wild horses in the area. We had a great night and went to bed. The next morning around 8, 8.30, we heard the strongest, wildest sound we've ever heard. 
It sounded like a woman screaming for her life. How many times have you heard that description? It scared the shit out of both of us. My guy and I discussed this in like that day. We chalked it down to be some kind of a weird bird. A pteranondon, a, a, a pteranondon, possibly, lol. <laughs> <clears throat> We went on another adventure and walked around the forest. We found big, round, concave spots in the ground surrounding our campsite. They looked like spots where an animal would bed down. I noticed one hole that had tons of twigs in it. I remember thinking, how would a horse be able to bring all these twigs here? We enjoyed our day, then went to bed. What's going on here? Huh. Minor emergency sort of there. Poor Sarah just came home from the doctor getting blood work done. There's a young girl there. Obviously brand new, didn't know what the hell she was doing and was ramming the needle in her right in there. So many times it made her almost dizzy, passed out and puke. Poor things came home mess. All good now. Now where was I? Start right about here. We went on another adventure and walked around the forest. We found big, round, concave spots in the ground surrounding our campsite. They looked like spots where an animal would bed down. I noticed one hole through that. I noticed one hole though that had tons of twigs in it. I remember thinking, how would a horse be able to bring all these twigs here? We enjoyed our day, then went to bed. The next morning at 8 30, we woke to the same sound. A sound like a woman in distress, but it wasn't as frantic as the morning before. Then we heard the same call, but it sounded far away, only a few seconds later. We discussed it again, came to the conclusion it must be a weird bird, because it sounded like it was high above us. The last day we were there, we were still exploring, found a natural spring was close by. The spring caused swamp-like conditions. There's moss everywhere, almost resembling carpet. We packed up, came home. My guy and I are still discussing the event of the screaming because it was such a different sound than anything we ever heard before. I decided to look up on the internet. I don't use the usual provider. I looked up animals that sounded like a woman screaming. What I found scared me to pieces. Listen to this recording and tell me I'm not losing my mind. Now my guy wants to go back to the bush, be up by eight and feed this animal a steak and make friends with it. Excuse me, I'll be sleeping in my vehicle. My story is absolute 100% true story. Never. Have I ever? What do you think? All right, well, she thing is I don't have enough service in here. I'll try to click on it. I don't think I have enough service to do anything in here. If I do, I'm gonna let her rip through my phone. It's not doing it. I got half of a frickin' bar, I think. It's not working. All right, I'll have to try that later. Sorry. Hopefully, this is a, you're, one the, you're the first email, aren't you? So usually, you know, my brain works. I'll carry on reading more. And then I'll forget to add that shit in, unfortunately. But anyway, uh, the fact that you emailed us, you know what it was. And the funny thing is, when everybody says it sounded like a pterodactyl, it sounded like a, a dinosaur. Who was the first person that came up to make the artificial sound of a pterodactyl and a dinosaur? And what they have to go by? Why did they think that's what they sound like? Because you know what? Now mainstream population thinks they know what a pterodactyl or a, ter or a dinosaur sounds like. Isn't that amazing? When meanwhile, for all we know, they could have just hissed or nothing, <laughs> right? It's funny though. Is it kind of fun? Everybody describes something like it might have been a pterodactyl. Meanwhile, no one we know has ever been around one, possibly. Here's another one titled, thanks for sending that in again too. And uh, be careful if you're gonna go out there and start feeding anything, all right? Feeding things doesn't ever work out unless you're hunting yourself to destroy intentionally. Feeding things usually ends up in something getting destroyed. This title, my apologies. Hi Steve. Hi Steve, first of all I'd like to thank you for providing an outlet slash service for people. Listening to everyone's encounters has made a difference in my life. Second, I want to extend my apologies to everyone that's been scrutinized, doubted, ridiculed, made fun of by someone like me. Once a person has their own encounter, it sure does change the way you look at things. I had a life-changing experience last August 3rd, 2021 in Wisconsin, just south of Highway 70, next to the St. Crow River. 
I live in the Minnesota side of the St. Crow, and the reason I was over there was because of my sorry. The reason I was over there was because of my well quit working. Because my well quit working and I was getting myself some spring water that someone had just told and showed about. Well, St. Crocs? Quirks? Sorry. Yeah, obviously my punctuations are not the best. C-R-O-I-X. Well, it was about 8 in the morning and there's no name Dead End Road. And there's this no name Dead End Road that ends up at the St. Crocs River. But halfway down the road to the river, there was a creek that I was getting this water from. I'd fill big jugs and five gallon pails full. And when I took a couple steps to get back up the bank to the road in my truck, the tailgate down and I would slide the water in. When I got up the bank, I saw what I thought was a bear about 50 yards down the dead end road towards the river. We looked at each other eye to eye and I had froze. After a second or two, it turned away and walked off into the tree line. I continued getting water, but I never took my eyes off that area. I wasn't going to let that bear sneak up on me. So, a few minutes passed, and about 100 yards down the dirt road, 50 past where I saw the bear, there was this big, black, hairy thing doing something to this telephone pole that power a power line ran on typo that a power line ran on. Then this other hairy creature, not as big, walked up to the one doing something to that pole and looked like it said something to it. Then it started to walk away, but stopped and turned around and went back to the bigger one like I forgot to say something, and then it turned to walk away again. And all of a sudden, what I thought was a bear walked up on all four to them, and then all three of them looked at me at the same time. And right at that time, something growled at me from my left side, behind the tree line, and I couldn't see it. Needless to say, I got the hell out of Dodge real quick. It scared the shit out of me. Not literally, but I jumped in my truck and I was gone. Well, then I got to the top of the next hill and I thought I should, I should have took some pictures. So I took my phone, set it to the camera, and started back down that hill. There's no way that I was going to turn around and get caught down there trying to turn around. Anyways, the road curved and it was hard to get in a position to take some, so I just went, oh, sorry. Anyways, the road curved and it was too hard to get in a position to take some, so I just went home. I made a couple calls and my friend had made a couple calls, so now people were calling me wanting to go back down there with guns and stuff, and I said, I don't know. My one friend was working, so that would have had to wait. But I spoke with my neighbor, and he's like 6'5", long black hair and a ponytail, like the biker type, and he said he'd go back down there with me, and that he wasn't afraid of anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. I said, okay, because I wanted to get more water. All the way there, I was trying to tell him but about... All the way there, I was trying to tell him about, but he had other things on his mind, and thought that something other than what I was telling him was going on. We got back to the creek, and we were getting more water, and I pointed out to where it all happened, and then when we were done getting the water, we jumped in my truck and went down the dirt road where I thought, went down that dirt road where I thought was a bear. Shut the truck off, and we got out, and he says to me, what's that stick in the road? And I was like, what are you talking about? And then I seen the stick. Something was using the stick as a tool digging in the road. I looked on the side of the road where it went, and there was broken trees, small ones, nonetheless, and everything was packed down. And there was some kind of gray material strewn about, and my friend asked what it was. And I took a closer look, and it was a wasp nest ripped up. He said, now you're freaking me out. Because just before that, I told him that bears don't use sticks as tools. Now, what really got him was the bear footprints by the stick. And those footprints were just like human footprints. Then I also remembered then I also remembered that what I made eye contact with had a flesh toned face, not a typical bear face. Of course there was no doubt that, that was a young Bigfoot, but yet it went probably three hundred pounds. We then went farther down the road to the pole and looked for tracks. There were none to be found, but all the vegetation was packed down. 
There's no doubt in my mind what I saw and no one doubts my word. And I even got pictures of the footprints to validate my encounter, if anyone ever doubts me. My name is Mike Dawkin, and I've been back there, but I don't go alone and I get my well water. I don't go alone and I got my well working now so I don't have to go. I want to tell you a couple other things that you might find interesting. You want to know why they don't like and kill canines? Well, I was thinking that maybe they will eat them like they would eat a horse. And I was telling my niece this and she said they're probably used to dealing with wolves and such and that they consider dogs and wolves and or coyotes. Let me read that again. Why am I screwing up? I was telling my niece this and she said that they're probably used to dealing with wolves and such that they consider dogs wolves and or coyotes. Makes sense to me. Sorry it's so long, but I did condense it some. Thanks, and we're getting closer to the truth, Mike. Okay, Mike, uh, for some weird reason, the second you said that you heard the voice growl to your left, that, I instantly thought, I instantly thought to myself, oh shit, so they can throw their voice. Possibly, right? Because what are the chances that one, if one had to go al alarm the other two, possibly to you being there, they all three spin around, and once they did that, the growl sound comes from right beside you, right? Why didn't the growl sound come before they looked at you? Why didn't the growl sound come before they realized you were there, right? Why would the fourth one be exactly right beside you when the other two didn't have a clue you were there until the third one said, hey, guess what's over here, right? I think that's a very strong possibility that they are throwing their voice directly at you. Maybe. I don't know. Speculation, obviously. But that, that experience makes sense to me for that is what has probably happened, I think. But anyway, welcome to the club, man. Welcome to the club. And there's no escaping. And you're never, ever, ever not going to think about those beings ever again. <laughs> Every time you go anywhere where there's forest, right? Welcome to the club. Member number, who knows? <clears throat> who knows? All right, here's another one. Jog memory and my two cents. Hey Steve, the video you posted August 15th, 2022, titled Threatening Text. <clears throat> this to the topic of sleep paralysis and skinwalkers came up. Sparked a memory from my childhood slash early teen years. Probably from the age of 8 to 15 years old, I would periodically have sleep paralysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. Unlike the emailer, which could control them. I couldn't control them. Or I couldn't control them and they would happen at random. Well, kind of random. Whenever I fall asleep on my back is when it would happen, as well as for lucid dreaming. Funny enough, I had a fear of sleeping on my back probably up until junior year of high school. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm 24 now, and these things no longer happen. Terrifying to say the least. But I've overcome my fear of the paranormal, especially when you have God on your side. To get to the point, during one of my many episodes, I saw a skinwalker-like creature when I managed to open my eyes, which was rare during a paralysis. It was standing in the doorway of my room. One thing that was odd about this encounter is that I wasn't scared because the face reminded me of Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, LOL. It was about four and a half feet tall, pale, and I was in such a fog, I could only see the head and partial torso for some reason. Just remembered staring at it with its black eyes and pale face. I must have drifted asleep or something because that's all I really remember. Never really thought too hard about it and thought it was just my mind and dream state. I've always been aware of the paranormal growing up, just not with the info that I have now. Like how you can access the spirit world through dream state. Interesting stuff, but stay away, far away. You ask why some Bigfoot kill dogs. It's probably just because they remind them of dogman pups. Not sure if that's been pointed out yet already, lol. Also, the pressure we talk about from these beings doesn't seem to be unique only to them. Demons also have this capability. I've been waking up from a dead sleep due to sinister presence in my room. 
You can actually feel which way the direction of the energy is coming from and the distance roughly, which is crazy. Just have to cast them out in the name of Jesus and you're good. Used to be scary to me, but now it's just annoying. That's very, very rare though. My house isn't haunted or anything. I think they're just passing through or I'm inviting them on accident. I don't know. Used to have precog dreams as well and lost them a couple years back. I don't know why. Never saved anyone's life or foresaw some tragedy. Just random events that eventually came into fruition. Ha <laughs> ha. The last thing I want to say is that I've had two vivid Bigfoot dreams. The one is where I'm watching a Bigfoot walk through the woods at a bird's eye view in broad daylight and it turns back to look up at me. The second dream I had about two to three times, I'm walking along a stream slash river on a dirt path that runs parallel and large rocks on the side of the path scattered and I'm clearly walking up on a Bigfoot who thinks he's hiding behind a big rock. You can clearly see him because the rock isn't big enough to hide his body. I get within the vicinity of him and just stare at him and it throws its arm up with a disappointed look. I don't know what to, what to think. I'm just a dude from the suburbs of Southern California. Never been in the woods in my entire life. What? Never been in the woods my entire life. I've always just been curious about the things that don't exist, lol. Thank you for all you do, Steve. I've been watching you for almost a year now. Don't let anybody stop you. God bless you and your family. Thanks. All right, man. Thanks for that email. Interesting thing about the dog, the why they hate dogs. You get a lot of people email me in an idea. And I don't know. I haven't a clue because for me, what I knew, as an example, what I know about wolves, wolves do not tolerate any other canine's presence, period. They don't, including other wolves. Wolves are the number one killers of wolves. They can't stand them. They do not tolerate them, period. But I, I, but we have had a few people have written in about seeing these things with a wolf and with domestic dogs, and off they go. So who knows, right? Who knows? But tearing, if you, if you, let's just say you were one of these beings, you can't stand canines at all, won't tolerate them. You go and kill a domestic dog, you tear it in half. But then you go out of your way to throw it at the door of the house it came from and leave it on the porch. Well, that's not really about the canine then, is it? It's about the person who owns it, right? So I don't know, it's a mystery. I'm not really concerned about it. I mean, I am very curious, but I would hopefully one day, I want, I want the direct 100% answer from somebody who possibly communicates with these beings so they've got the message out somehow. And um, I would be very curious to know the actual firsthand, straight from the source reason. Then another thing I'm going to share with you guys too is uh, not all, you know, it's not just these beings that have these so-called supernatural powers or other humans, which we do. Um, here's a fact. Here's an interesting fact while we're on the top of the wolves. There's these three, three or four Alaskan biologists, and they were also all seasoned successful trappers. And they were, they were monitoring a few, three packs of wolves, I believe, and I think one of the largest national parks in Alaska, the state of Alaska. And they said, and these packs all had collars, I think on the alphas, so they accurately tracked their movements. And lots of you don't understand, but wolves, a pack of wolves use natural borders as borders to their, their terrain. Sometimes it's a road, sometimes it's the height of land on a mountain with a cliff on the other side. Sometimes it's, it's the bend in a river, a river bank. That's their border. And if you were another wolf and you cross that border, physically walk across that invisible border that that wolf pack has laid down, they know instantly and they turn and basically start running. Now get this one. These scientists, our biologists proved it. They observed the one neighboring wolf pack crosses into the zone of the other wolf pack starts cruising along those wolves were 60 miles away abruptly stopped dead spun around and started beelining straight back exactly to where that neighboring pack of wolves trespassed into their territory what the hell is up with that seriously holy shit right it's amazing 
It's an amazing fact about wolves. So, what skills do we have but we don't have anymore, right? Everything else seems to have some kind of a skill. Why are our skills rubbed out and not promoted and not taught? Anyway, thought I'd drop that little piece of knowledge on you guys. Thanks for sending that in, man. Sorry for my interruption. Um, yeah. Uh-oh. What's this one? Did I screw up? What have I done here? All right. Here's a new one. Before I screw up again. Bigfoot in the Northwest. Dear sir, several decades ago in the mountains of northwestern USA, I was stalking a man-made trail through the swamp looking for grouse. A little stream ran along one side of the trail. I was just a kid. I was barefoot, walking as silently as possible. When I came around the bend, there in the middle of the trail was a large, shaggy man in a sort of a half crouch. He had a low-hung head. He was covered in shaggy, dark bay hair. Well, hair on the head and forearms was longer. Stringy hair hung down, hiding the face. What really caught my attention was the left hand, which was reached out toward the swamp, all five fingers extended. It looked like a large human hand. We faced each other for no more than three seconds when he leapt off the trail into the swamp, moving like no human can move. I was terrified. Bigfoot was not in my vocabulary in those days. Grandfather warned me many times of trolls in the woods. I thought I saw a troll. I turned right around, went home, didn't go back there for a couple of years. Soon after that experience, I climbed a difficult ridge overlooking a favorite fish hole to reach a patch of raspberries. A path there led to, into a structure of woven branches, living and dead, that formed a sort of a blind overlooking the fish hole below. Further in, I could see another more tightly woven structure. Something inside started grunting at me. Thought it must be a deer. I returned the sounds. It made more sounds. I kept returning them. They got louder, more aggressive, stronger. Then it started to shake a couple small trees. It suddenly struck me. This is no deer. I went silent. So did it. I tried to peer through the darkness. I could see nothing. Then I received, clear as you please, a message in my mind. This is not good. This is not, this place is not for you. Move along. I got up and left. Over several, sub over several subsequent years, I, st I stalked that trail through the swamp again. And many times, a tall, dark figure paced along beside me in the swamp, matching my steps. I could see the dark shape moving with me, and I could hear it move. If I stopped, it stopped. A few times I tried to talk to it, nothing happened. One time when I was on that trail with a friend, I didn't sense the hairy man around. We went off the trail into the swamp. We found a small clearing scattered with animal bones. Often while stalking through the mountains in that area, I heard strange calls unlike any other animal I knew. On a number of occasions when exploring the new areas, I was confronted with that same message. This place is not for you. Move along. I always moved along. Until a few months ago, I never put all this together. All I knew about Bigfoot was vague impressions and a sense that it was something that didn't really exist. It was only a few months ago that I seriously looked into the subject. With a few hours, I thought, this seems real. After three days of research, I was 100% certain that they really existed. The proof was overwhelming. At first, I didn't think about my experiences, but over the next couple of weeks, I found myself looking back and started putting things together. I realized that I had almost certainly had very close encounters with Bigfoots when I was younger. Ever since, I've been plagued with the need to understand them, especially to answer the question, what are they really? Looking back, it's like I've been avoiding any information, any information about Bigfoots. It's like an, it's like on an unconscious level, I didn't want to know. Despite convincing myself that the hairy man I saw was just a hobo, I only entered that area with great trepidation and extreme caution. Deep down, I knew it wasn't a hobo. The hobo theory was prosperous preposterous, beyond reason. It's hard to explain how I was ever able to entertain such a crazy explanation. Recognizing the truth of Bigfoot opened some kind of door in my mind. Now that door's been opened, 
I find I'm looking harder at more and more things, not just Bigfoots. It's like I live my whole life with the wool in my eyes. It's like I've been living in a world of, full of beaver dams, where I never before suspected the exist, existence of beavers. Why is it that many of us with these experiences try so hard to not understand, to forget? You can say my name and where I live. My name is Oscar Hart Weeson. I live in Burns, Oregon. Thank you, sir, for what you do. And there's another holy shit story. Is that amazing, eh, that somebody can actually see, see one of these things to the detail? strands of hair, and then the human mind manages to block it out and try to deny what it, what it just saw. Isn't that so bizarre? It's just so weird to me. Sometimes I wonder if maybe I'll wake up one day and remember something from my childhood. I don't know. I mean, it might possibly happen to any one of us, right? I hope not. I hope I recall everything so far to date accurately. And there's another, another member of the club. The club just keeps getting bigger every single day. Somewhere in the world, a new member's um, submitted to us. This is the title of my story. Steve, first of all, let me say I'm enjoying your channel. I like your no-nonsense, it is what it is attitude. I really love hearing Neff. I listen regularly to various channels about the Sasquatch people. I cringe when I hear them refer, referred to as animals. Some channels concentrate on just the facts. You know which one I mean. Personally, as with all my conspiracy theories, I gather up all of the evidence. Before I develop this attitude, I would stick simply to the beast in the wild theory. My friend loaned me a book that listened to listed various sightings of the creatures. When I go to the stories about Bigfoot with UFOs, I thought that it, it was just too out there. So nowadays, I try to weigh all the evidence, physical or otherwise. My story isn't much, really. I'm still not sure it was a sighting, but here it goes. I was born in San Antonio, Texas. When I was five years old, my dad moved us to the woods of Arkansas. I spent many hours in the woods and I was quite comfortable. In some ways, I felt the forest were my element. This area was near the community of Jenny Lind, Arkansas, some 13 miles southeast of Fort Smith, next to the Oklahoma border. Around the time of 7172, as when I was about 12 years old, I was walking through the woods casually, back to my house. <clears throat> but this one day, I felt the uneasy feeling of being watched like something was there that didn't want me there, or my senses saying, danger, whatever. This feeling spooked me and I started running. These woods were not too densely forested at this particular place, but there were quite a few trees. After running a few feet, I stopped and looked behind me. I saw nothing. Again, I took off running. I stopped again. This time I saw this tree that looked very odd. My mind's eye pictured it as a being, possibly even swaying with a grin on his face. What? I decided my mind was playing tricks on me and I continued running home. That's my story. I also have dreams about them on occasion. One dream was so real that it's like a memory. In my mind's eye, I was riding in a vehicle, car, truck, I don't know, but my head seemed to be out the window and the vehicle passed a family of them. I guess four beings, single file walking the blacktop road toward my house. P.S. I've recently heard the term Sabe. Do you know if this is what they call themselves? Patrick. <clears throat> Patrick, uh, that is a word that the Ojibwe use, a name they use and have used forever when they're referring to these people. So, um, and my attitude about this topic myself, it's up to everybody else what, how you're going to... Everybody's on their own individual ride. Everybody has their own individual puzzle they're looking for the pieces too. And everybody's encouraged you to take from it what you will or leave it. And I've shared with everybody that me personally, I strongly believe that the first other people that came here, they should have listened to the, the original, the native peoples that were here before they got here. They should have listened to them with every detail of all their knowledge. You can't just come to a new land, listen to the inhabitants, share everything with you, look you straight in the eye, share with you honestly the facts. This is what's here, this is what we've lived with, this is what we've been dealing with, this is what we fought wars with. This is how you eat, this is how we do this, this is how we do that, this is how we hunt this. We don't eat that, we eat those, everything. And then the new people came here and decided that they're going to believe them, trust them, learn how to survive on this land from them. Oh no, but we're not going to believe that other shit. 
Okay, we're no, we're not gonna believe that other shit you shared with us. Okay, so sorry for the ramble, but that is where I decided for me that I will listen to the people that were here first, and if they say these people were referred to as the Sabe people, I'm calling them Sabe, right? For me, it just makes a lot more sense than going. Hey man, it was a Bigfoot. Well, <laughs> saw me a Bigfoot. Right? So that's where that comes from. Thanks again for that share, man. Thanks for the share. <clears throat> Here comes another one. This is titled Legend Meets Legend. East Oregon Blue Mountains. I have one and only one experience that didn't really involve me but my Uncle Larry is an avid outdoorsman and is extremely knowledgeable about all the wildlife in America, North America. My uncle has hunted and logged in all kinds of Bigfoot ground. We are going on hunting the same area for 79 years, and one early evening during the second season bull elk mid-November, me and my buddy, two of my aunts, my pops, and my uncle Larry made a hunt we call bootleg. It starts up on open scrub flats that eventually drop into several steep draws that run down into a steep canyon with a river that runs all year round. We always make a plan the night before on a map because we try to hunt an area different than the year prior. It's around one o'clock. Me and my buddy are the youngest so we are known as the dogs of the hunt. We drop down to the canyon and my pop stays a little ways behind and walked the top rim down towards my uncle Larry and two ends that were all set up in different crossings slash escape routes the batch of bulls like to use because it's a bachelor group of bulls for who's not familiar like to use when sneaking out of the canyon two hours into the hunt my buddy and I heard a shot sounded like pops right above us we waited for a bit and then decided to slowly make our way up to the top rim pops made a great shot on a perfect meat five point after getting the bull quartered out, we made two trips packing out to the scab flats. You mean scrub or scab? It's spelled scab twice. Scab flats to an old skid road. An hour or so later, and it's almost dark. We finally reach one of my aunts. Well, we finally reach one of my aunts on the radio, and she sounded like her nerves were shook up, and all she said was, "Where are you at?" Pops told her. Another hour passes, and now it's nighttime. Both my aunts come rolling up. The old skid road on the side by side. Pops asked where Larry was, and they all looked at Pops and said, Did you not hear that deep scream after you shot? Pops and I were like, What? <clears throat> it was close to Larry, and he hightailed it back to camp on his wheeler. Well, piled on the UTV and the bull and went back to camp. When we got back, Uncle Larry was out by the big fire with his rifle leaned on a tree heating up a big pot of stew while drinking a beer. Pops pull up to the fire, shuts off, shuts the UTV off and says, well, he's not a monster, but he'll be damn tasty. Uncle Larry said, I saw and heard something that I can't explain. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm done hunting here. And that was six years ago, and my aunts and uncle have never been out to that camp since. I've been all over out in the area and have have over a dozen trail cams set up in very remote, thick timbered, steep rock faces with benches, what I would call Sasquatch country. I've had bear, cougar, wolves, coyote, badger, deer, elk, pine squirrel, chipmunk, woodpecker, hawk, magpie, lots of blank shots at all times of day and night. Nothing yet that confirms Bigfoot like characteristics. They either don't exist or they are extremely smart. You can tell by the look on Uncle Larry's face that whatever he saw it, Whatever he saw, he wanted to be seen, and is in fact very smart. That's my only story on the big legend. My Uncle Larry is a badass, to say the least, and for him to not ever come... My Uncle Larry is a badass, to say the least, and for him to not ever come back to an area he has hunted all his life was startling. Uncle Larry later told me at Christmas, after your dad shot was when the deep scream shot right through my body and I looked right in the direction of the scream through my scope and saw something very large crouched on two legs looking right at me under a fir tree about 400 yards or so across the steep draw for just a couple seconds. 
and then it just took one leap down and bro broke a boulder loose that crashed down the canyon and went out of sight. My Uncle Larry said it was very unsettling not knowing where it was headed and based on the leap it took Uncle Larry and based on the leap it took Uncle Larry said he sure as hell was not on top of the food chain and didn't feel safe even with his rifle. For that to come out of his mouth, a true legit outdoorsman in his late 60s and still in better shape than me, someone that I can honestly say has been there and done that, speaks volumes. Even to this day, I still get a hair or two that rise when I hunt through bootleg. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No doubt, man. Thanks for that share. And isn't it funny? <clears throat> it just reminded me of some friend of mine second generation taxidermist in Vancouver, British Columbia. Very talented at what they do. And uh, we were sturgeon fishing on the Fraser River one time in his boat. And I brought up the topic. I said, hey, you ever, ever uh, heard of anybody or see a Sasquatch or anything that looks like that? He just looked at me and went, nope. Just like that. And I didn't say another word about the topic. See, it's, it doesn't take long for me to understand when somebody actually does have interest, wants to engage, and somebody thought out Nope. Okay. <laughs> then I drop the topic and get back to fishing. Same person. Two years later. Comes beating on my door when I'm living in the Pemberton Valley. And he has for me a can. Was it a can of, or a bag? Can. It was a can of plaster of Paris, I think. Whatever it was said here, if you ever see a Sasquatch or Bigfoot print here, you're probably going to see one, so get, make sure you cast his footprint. I'm like, what are you talking about? I thought you didn't believe in that shit. He goes, well, <clears throat> a good friend of mine, a lifelong customer, was hunting in between Squamish and Gibsons. All right, that's how sound, where I have a photograph of a footprint in the snow a friend of mine found. And I, had, I know a girl who heard screams going across House Sound to the Sea of Sky Highway just around the corner from the city of Vancouver. And uh, these guys were hunting in those mountains and they watched this nine, eight, nine foot tall, hairy, black dude walk straight across a slide slope in front of them. And I'm, I, didn't, I didn't say anything, but I'm thinking, well, then again, I guess I didn't share my story with them either, did I? Maybe if I shared my story with them, it would have made it different. But anyways, I guess these guys went straight to his shop. They were in the shop right after the hunt, and they were wide-eyed and, and on fire, panically telling them about what they saw. And my friend didn't question them for a tenth of a second and got enthusiastic like that. <laughs> and, and he still is. Funny how people, how people operate, right? You can have five or six people or ten or whatever tell somebody they saw what they saw, and those people go... Oh yeah, cool. But then when it's somebody else who they possibly hold higher up says that's what they saw, then it sinks in. Isn't that funny? People not trusting people, right? All right. <clears throat> this is a fairly long one. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna dive into it because we got to get more people heard. They're stacking up. There's so many people who need to be heard. This is called date with the time portal. Hi, Steve. I've adopted you as my Canadian brother that has rule changed. I found it hard to listen to the supposed authority of governing bodies. Good for you. That being said, let's journey back in time to either 71 or 72. It was early morning, maybe 1 or 1.30 a.m. on a Friday or Saturday. My friend and I had just finished a nice, fun-filled weekend. A crisp, clear evening. It had been as the clock ticked forward to the a.m. hours of the next day. We pulled into the gravel driveway to a remote forest cabin in the mountain village of Wildwood, Oregon at the base of Mount Hood. One of the large Cascade mountain ranges, volcanoes around 14,000 feet in height. The village of Wildwood is a remote little village with one gravel road cut into the forest off the Black Top Highway, 26. This is the main road from Portland to Mount Hood going east. <clears throat> This village is unique in the fact that each plot for a cabin is just cut from the forest. A 100 foot cookie cutter circle is cut from the forest, then 50 feet of forest separating the next cookie cut 100 foot circle. The gravel road is maybe 50 cabins. The gravel road has maybe 50 cabins dropped into the forest in this manner. From one cabin to the next, <clears throat> either can be seen. Our 
a frame cabin. Our A-frame cabin was the only cabin with a light on that, that early morning hour. Sorry, I'm getting a little messed up here. I don't know why. We pulled in the driveway. I went to the front door. Realizing I didn't have the key, I proceeded to the rear cabin deck, which had a window four feet from the ground. I proceeded to attempt to open the locked window with a pocket knife. I then asked my friend, Ish, I then asked my friend Ish to see if he could go back to his truck and see if he could find a coat hanger or wire, something similar, that I could use to get the wood unlocked. He left the porch, heading back to his truck, 100 feet back into the dark forest. I immediately felt like I was being watched from the forest. My neck here turned to wire. I attempted to speed up the en entry attempts. We had a lowland shepherd wolf mix as one of our pets. His name was Thor. Thor was on the back deck with me. All of a sudden, Thor began to run on the back deck, leaping off while barking frantically. Wolves don't bark. I never heard Thor bark like a dog as he leapt off the three foot high deck to the forest floor. He completed a 60 foot circle from the back porch out into the forest, running through the brush. Then leaping back up onto the porch, rushes up to me with his tail between his legs. He cowered under my outstretched legs. So I looked down under my legs, seeing our half wolf trembling in fear, hiding under me so I could protect him. Ha <laughs> ha. I'm taking all this in. What scared Thor so bad he was trembling in fear under my legs? What scared Thor so bad he was trembling in fear under my legs? He usually chases bears, cats, and raccoons. So what put the fear of God into Thor? Just as I was attempting to grasp it all, the last three minutes of whatever had been happening since we arrived at the cabin, Thor jumps up running and barking again. As he is about to do his run, jump off the deck to the forest floor again. This time I followed him. I ran the 10 feet to the edge of the deck and a frame wall. Thor was out doing his frantic barking circling. As I peered around the side of the A-frame, staring from the back to the front, all of a sudden, eight feet in front of me, the forest shrubs parted, and King Kong stepped out of the split in the forest shrubs. All eight and a half, nine foot in height of him. I gasped in awe. The creature I was eight feet from stepped out of myth and and legend to absolute reality. I'd heard the stories of the hairy giants of the forest since I was six to eight years old when my family would camp at the base of Mount St. Helens in Washington and exploring the ape caves of that region. Fear of the unknown, fear of the unknown slammed me. In one smooth move like a USA gold medalist, I catapulted myself off the deck with a one hand push off push off, landing myself beyond the stacked firewood at the base of the deck. When I hit the forest floor with my feet, time changed. I remember the flash showing me the time was... What? I remember the flash showing me the time was 200,000 years in the past. The cabin vanished and was there no longer. I knew I was 200,000 years back in time. The silence of the forest up to this point was mystical. I was now in the forest bushes like in a cave, kind of made from natural bushes, staring towards the sandy river 50 feet away that descended from Mount Hood, moving down towards the coast two hours away, I saw a glow, like an aura in front of me, realizing it was a female of the creature I had seen four seconds ago on the back porch of a cabin in the year 7172. As soon as I realized there was a second one, at that instant, she spoke to me in my mind, mind speak, asking me, what are those lights in the sky? I immediately was stunned and relieved at once, stunned because she had communicated. Relieved because at that moment I knew they were people, a tribe like that, not some monsters that they were just out for blood to unsuspecting humans. So now the fear of the unknown immediately lifted. As soon as I could put together a picture of the sun and show her the stars or lights in the sky were suns. Just far, far away, I jumped up and began to run towards 
the front of the 100 foot circle that made up our cabin's yard as I wanted now to see the mail close up from the front. At this time, my friend Ish had just made it back from his truck. Seeing a giant shadow cast onto the streets, it made up a cinerama type forest screen. Clearly, we both could see a giant Kong type entity walking, swinging its arms. As Ish begins to yell, what, what, what's that? I immediately cover his mouth with my hand, but now too late. The entity stops walking and looks back over its shoulder as it stops. Thor appears again on my side, boosting my courage as I run along the 75 foot length of the cabin, out of the front, sorry, as I run along the 75 foot length of the cabin out in the front yard circle of grass, one large fir slash pine tree stood in the middle of the yard. Thor runs to the base of the tree, sits on his haunches and stares up into the tree. I'm standing under it and it would have had to do, and all it would have to do is drop down and land on me. I'm sure that is how it hunts on some occasions. I yelled to Ish, the big shadow was a Bigfoot and it was now in the 150 foot tall tree Thor was staring up into. I said, let's go, go, go. We jumped into his truck and took off, not returning for two days. We could see where it stepped from the forest onto the gravel path three feet wide that ran the length of the cabin. Since 1971-72, my life changed. My eyes opened. I knew the reality. I knew the reality. They, the powers that be, were sharing with us was not the real reality. So I went off to discover what was the true reality. Half a list of stories like you present on your YouTube channel for over 50 years now from 100 different presenters, my puzzle's getting clearer and clearer. I had known that the forest giants were sighted many times along with UFOs, right before, during, or after the UFO is seen. They've been seen inside UFOs by abductees. They've been seen beamed out from underneath the UFO in Wisconsin. However, the female that mine spoke to me didn't know the stars were suns leads me to believe they are not all involved with UFOs and space travel or she would have known the stars are suns. Having studied, having studied some of the most ancient written stories rendered by the scribes of Sumar, Babylon, India, and verbal legends of America, my puzzles kind of come together like this. They are Vedic renderings that move backwards in time millions of years, speaking of hybrid entities and travel between planets in a tighter timeline, pressed into the baked clay tablets of Sumer's cuneiform script. We have history rendered of our planet going back a half a million years. The sons of An, who hired the scribes, wrote, quote, when we landed upon this planet we call Slug Key, meaning orb of solid ground, not a gas planet, there was an apex biped that ruled the planet. After many tries and troubles, we deposited some of our life force into them. Now they can reason and understand our commands. The scribal renderings of our Sumar show they were here before the sons of An landed and began the genetic experiments that gave us the centaur, Miniotin goat, sorry, Miniotian bill, the other legends of genetic people manipulated creatures. Sumer scribes and Indian scribes talk of some of them going on space rides to do missions with the sons of An. That's an A-N. An. The Epic of Gilgamesh describes King Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh befriends Enkidu, who is a forest giant with some additional genes added to give him superpowers. I believe they are the original bipeds of this planet that evolved alongside mice, deer, raccoons, and grizzly bears. They all have fur. We, Homo sapiens sapiens, don't. We're not originally from here. I also believe they've been working hand in hand with the sons of An and possibly some of the other off-world entities like the Greys, etc. Love what you did to let this channel share what was experienced by the folks telling the stories. Like many others, I haven't told my story lots because so many folks just think you're nuts or something. Thanks for taking the time out of your life doing this for the planet and its people. All right, there you go. Appreciate it, man. Another member of the Club of No Return is someone who's spending a lot of time digging trying to find the answers. Right? 
digging and trying to find the answers. There's so many of us out there trying to do the same thing. It's so funny what, what people think is crazy, but meanwhile what they have in their everyday lives is accepted as normal. What the F is up with that, <laughs> right? What is up with that? I wonder how many puzzles out there are starting to get tighter. Smaller gaps missing in them. I hope a lot. Not too often we get people sharing what their puzzle is starting to read to them, is it? But I appreciate it. I want to hear more. I got a lot to share. I got a lot being sent to me from the same sources. And uh, it's piling up. And yes, it is in a very secure place. And it will be shared with all of you. But it's just to let you know, information is piling up. All right? Piling up. Now I got to go. It's getting freaking hot out. I got the, the shop door wide open to kill the echo and the heat is pouring in. I picked up all our baby meat, chickens and turkeys yesterday. They're in the poultry barn. Now I possibly have a problem predator on the property right now. Great. So here I go. I'll be back again. Share my story at hothunt.com. Get it out here.